Hello, everyone. Uh, good afternoon from the UK. And I, I guess it's uh, there are participants from all over the world. So it's good morning for some and good evening for the rest. So uh, welcome to the third seminar of uh, ITDR. So we started this in order to kind of fill in the gap here in between our regular ITDR activities when the ITDR 2021 conference got postponed. So uh, this is the last seminar we are going to uh, have. And uh, next year we have the ITBR main conference. So we will be able to interact in person by then. So in this seminar, we have two special speakers. We have Dr. Shenhao Wang, uh, who is the 2019 recipient of the Eric Pass dissertation, uh, sorry, the honorable mention recipient of the Eric Pass dissertation award. And uh, we have Professor Juan de Dios Ortuza, uh, who is the 2012 Lifetime Achievement Award winner from IITBR. So uh, the seminar today will focus on a deep neural network for choice analysis. So the way we are going to do it is Shen Hao will first present his uh, doctoral dissertation research. And then we will have Mr. Juan de Dios to talk about the future research directions uh, in this area. Okay, uh, so let me just before while we are waiting for a couple of more people to sign in, let me just give a brief intro about the speakers. So Dr. Shenhao Wang is a joint research scientist at MIT Urban Mobility Lab and Human Dynamics Group in Media Lab. His research focuses on developing interpretable, generalizable, and ethical deep learning models to understand individual decision-making with special applications to urban mobility. He uh, synergizes discrete choice models and deep neural networks in travel demand modeling by interpreting the black box deep neural networks uh, with economic theory. And this helps to instill behavioral insights into the deep neural networks. And he is now working on explaining the classical scope of discrete choice modeling by incorporating unconventional data structures like image and graph. And he's also working on socially aware urban computing. And he's seeking to improve the equity of the computational algorithms in their applications to behavior modeling. Uh, he completed his PhD uh, with Professor Jinhua Zhao in 2019 from MIT. And before that, he received his BA in economics from Peking University and BA in architecture and law from Tsinghua University. And he also got a master of science in transportation uh, in urban planning uh, from MIT. And after that, so we will hear from Professor Juan de Dios Ortuzer. Most of you are familiar with him uh, by, through his textbook, Modeling Transport, which most of us have read uh, when we have started our journey in transportation. So he's an emeritus professor at the Pontifical Catholic University of Chile, Santiago. And he specializes in discrete choice model, valuation of externalities, design and collection of mobility and preference surveys, and transportation forecasting. He received his BSc in maths in civil and civil engineering uh, from uh, Pontifical Catholic University of Chile, where he's working now. And he did his MSc and PhD from University of Leeds. Uh, so he's a founding member of a couple of institutes, including the Institute of Complex Engineering Systems and the Center for Sustainable Urban Development. In recognition of his outstanding contributions to the field, he has received uh, an honorable uh, honorary doctorate, the Doctor, Doctor Honoris Causa from University of Cantabria, Spain in 2018, the Humboldt Research Award from the Alexander von Humboldt Foundation in 2010, and the ITBR Lifetime Achievement award in 2012. Okay, so I think we have uh, already uh, more than 100 participants for the webinar, so I won't waste much time. So I will hand over to Shen Hao Wang for his presentation. And just to mention, if you have any questions, just type them in the Q&A box and we will get to them after the discussion. Thank you, Prisma. Uh, let me start to share my screen.
All right, um, so let's get started. Um, uh, I'm Shenghao Wang, uh, currently a research scientist at MIT. So the, today the talk will be about deep neural networks for choice analysis, as suggested by the title here. Um, So this is the outline for today's talk. Um, I divide into three parts. The first part is a very quick introduction into the background, um, the choice, the classical discrete choice models, and then the motivation, uh, what kind of question we try to address in this, in this presentation. And the second part, I combine uh, five papers together and I mainly introduce the three of them. Um, I tend to tell a coherent story by the five papers instead of treating them as kind of individual papers. And I'll probably spend 25 minutes on that. And in the end, I will uh, spend maybe 10, 10 minutes on discussing the implications of my work. So let's get started with the first part, the background. So um, this figure just shows the classical choice analysis in urban mobility, and it is the classical example of choosing different trial modes, choose between the driving or public transit. We compare the alternate specific variables, typically the monetary cost and the, uh, and the travel time. In the end, um, those travelers make a decision. So this choice analysis is uh, actually a very broad um, broader question go beyond the urban mobility field. Um, and as a result, we have classical choice modeling framework uh, to address this, this type of question, where it initially developed in the 1970s, and then have been keep being worked on for uh, five decades. In this framework, we have four basic components, uh, a decision maker, um, these are alternatives, um, alternative specific variables, such as the price and the quality of each alternative. And then in the end, we um, assume a decision rule and typically the utility maximization or any others. And if we adopt the ut random utility maximization framework, we typically get the soft max activation function and to describe the choice probabilities. But these days, as the um, uh, machine learning framework become more and more popular, we have an alternative approach to think about the choice analysis. Basically, we could treat choice analysis as a black box prediction task. So we could just ignore the structure of the individual specific or alternate specific variables and put all, the, uh, all these variables as inputs and then just predict how people make a decision. And usually, if you just open your machine learning textbook and then you know, go to the chapter of supervised learning approach, you can see a long list of machine learning classifiers. Here is a just short list you know, about deep neural networks, disc discriminant analysis, Bayesian models, um, different trees and neural forests. You could choose any one of them to just uh, do the choice analysis. So as a result, we really see a tension between two modeling paradigms. On one side, we have all the it's called a theory-driven approach, um, represented by the three choice models. That's basically uh, based on the um, uh, microeconomic theory and combined with statistical theories, and then we get to that. we could analyze people individual decision making. But on the other side, we have the, those data-driven models, um, those machine learning models. One example is deep neural networks. It's a kind of black box approach, basically fitting the inputs um, to the output. So there really exists a tension between the two modeling paradigms, and sometimes we just name it as a glass box versus the black box approach. But we really could think about this tension in many different aspects. We could think about the prediction accuracy. For example, machine learning community always change. Maybe this three choice model cannot achieve very high predictive performance. But on the other side, uh, the three choice model community could change that, well, um, the machine learning models, deep neural networks, are really like just a black box. So they're not interpretable. So you can also think about the tension from other perspectives like generalization or robustness. And then the whole five papers uh, I present today would really try to reconcile this tension and find a synergetic framework to combine the two paradigms to address that choice analysis. So let's get to the five papers. Um, um, with these five papers, we really want to lay out a new theoretical foundation using DNN for choice analysis. So the first paper will talk about the uh, interpretation. Basically, it goes from the black box side to the black box side. It's saying if you use a very naive deep neural network, can we get economic information from the uh, the DNN, a, a very naive ANN? And the second is going from the glass box side to the black box side. They're asking if we have some uh, behavior knowledge, can we use some knowledge to desire, design new architecture or new models to get a better performance and implementation? And third is a synergetic framework, asking if we have the two modeling paradigms, discrete Charles model and DNM, can we really combine them in a very simple synergetic framework and get some benefits? And I will 
very quickly go through two other papers. Um, uh, one is a more kind of theoretical paper because the DNA is still pure often challenge. It does not have a very solid theoretical foundation. So I introduced a standard learning theory as a new foundation for DNA for choice analysis. And last one is a more applied paper about how to combine RP and SP uh, to understand the preference of outcome vehicles. So let's get started with the first one. So the first economic interpretation paper is really start with a simple question. Is DNA really a black box? So now we compare DCM and DNA, realize that they're really similar in shared um, utility interpretation. Because if we look at the DCM, the formula, we could see that it's actually a shallow neural network uh, with a specific architecture. And if you divide it into two parts, it's a the last layer is utility comparison, and all the like the only one layer is utility specification. Typically, is the linear form. And then we look at the DNN, you see the similar structure there. You could treat the last layer of DNN as a utility comparison layer, and all the layers prior to last layer is a utility specification layer. So as a result, you can see utility specification and the comparison, the two basic uh, building boxes uh, really exist in both DCM and DM. And as a result, DNNs have the two critical functions, the utility function and the choice of probability functions. And then we look at the list of economic information. We realize that the, all the economic information are somehow just as a, some function transformation of the utility function and the, the choice probability function. Um, here in the table, the left hand side is a list of economic information. You can see choice probability, choice prediction, market share, substitution patterns, social welfare, um, per derivatives, elasticities, and value of time. On the right hand side, it's just a formula, and you we use to compute this economic information from DNNs. So uh, because we have utility and the choice probability functions, we could get all the economic information from the internet. Um, in the paper, we really talk about the details of all the economic information, but in today's presentation, I will just give you the high level summary um, with two examples. The first example is the elasticity we gain from the internet. So I believe a lot of audience today, um, like uh, here, have done a lot of empirical studies using these charts models. We typically report some coefficient um, table describing relationship between inputs and outputs. Actually, we could do the same thing um, for DNN. So here is just kind of regression table we get from DNN. And you look at the table, there's coefficient there. Many of them are quite intuitive. For example, uh, DNN suggests that on average, if you uh, increase working time, and you will get the decrease of ch the choice probability for working. And if you look at the main diagonal, see those coefficients are all negative. So it's a very intuitive result. So at a high level, you can see DNN could provide economic information. And uh, for many of them, they're intuitive. But on the other side, sometimes the DNN does give us very irregular um, economic information. Here, I just have uh, try to compare the DCM and DNN's result. So on the left-hand side is a DCM result. The x-axis is we try to do some simulation to change our driving costs. And then we observe the change of the average choice probabilities. You can see it's a, um, the first figure is a really kind of regular DCM figure that when we increase the driving cost, the market share of driving starts to decrease very smoothly and all the alternatives market shares start to increase. But if you look at the DNN, you can see that by and large, the pattern is still kind of intuitive because when you increase driving costs, you can see the purple line, which is market share of driving or a decrease. But at a certain point for public transit, the market share also start to decrease. So it's a very counterintuitive uh, result. It kind of suggests for DCM, it tend to show very regular behavior patterns, but DNN, they tend to show very irregular behavior patterns. As a result, we could put a DCM, DNN on the two sides, and we really could understand this behavior intuition from a statistical learning theory perspective. So this figure in the middle is, is a figure you often see from machine learning textbook. Uh, X-axis describes the complexity of the uh, function class assume, and then when you have a more complex function class, you gain a larger estimation error, but smaller approximation error. So when you map the DCM and DNN to this, to this uh, figure, um, you can see that DCM tends to be on the left-hand side of the graph, and then DNN tends to be on the right-hand side of the graph. So if we just translate the start learning theory to behaving intuition, we could argue that DCM tends to be too simple to reflect reality, while DNN tends to be too complex to reflect reality. So if we gain this behaving intuition, then realize actually the way 
we developed this with Charles model in history is really try to enrich the models, right? So the first generation model and larger model this was um, created in 1974 by Mike Fadden. And then we make it more complex by going to the next larger model. And then in 2000, we get uh, trying Mike Fadden develop to develop um, the mixed larger model than the hybrid models. So we go from the simple to complex enriching the models. But for DNM, since DNN started as a universal approximator, the question becomes, how do we develop a DNN by really introducing some simplexity into that? And the answer lies to the regularization. And then it really comes to the second paper. And it started with the question, can we use some behavior knowledge to regularize DNN to get the novel model design? So the idea is we will use a, a, a design new architecture with this alternate specific utility functions. So let's change the visualization a little bit. So this graph is just another visualization of a fully connected deep neural network, very naive artificial neural networks. So the green box is just the input layer, the red box is the output layer, and in the middle, white boxes are the con fully connected layers. And then this x1 to xk are the alternate specific variable. Each xk is a, a vector, and z is an individual specific variable. So you think about the utility function in this fully connected neural network, I realized that the VK, this small K, is a function of all the uh, alternative attributes, right? But if you think about how we specify utility function in our discrete charts models, it is different because the VK is a function of only its own attributes. So VK is the F, SK only, not the other uh, attributes. So based on this simple principle, we design a DNN with alternative specific utility specification, we call it ASU DNN. And the, the architecture is Super simple, we just divide the whole network into K um, subnetworks so that we have this VK, the, the utility of alternative K is a function of only its own attributes. And this is a very simple design, but we get some interesting implications. The first implication is really sparsity, because if you think about the, the parameters in the first, like, uh, fully connected in the versus ASU DNA, realize that the parameters in the first one, they're kind of, is a, the private matrix is full in all the cells, it could have some values. But for ASU DNN, this architecture, you have only the you have value only on the own diagonal, main diagonals, but the off diagonal, they're all zeros. Basically, it says that within each subnetwork, you have the connection, but across subnetworks, you do not have those connections. A second implication is interesting is related to the IA constraint in discrete charts models. I assume um, to the audience are very familiar with IA constraint. Um, so if I just quickly go through that, it basically um, is kind of constant constraint on the, um, uh, the ratio of two choice probabilities. And then we compare two scenarios, and then we add one more alternative to the existing market. The market share of the existing uh, trial models do not change. And the second implication of ASUDN is that ASUDN really satisfies the IA constraint while fully connected DNN does not. That's because we just compute, we say, the ratio of P1 over P2, realize in fully connected DNN is a function of all the attributes, while you, in ASUDN is only a function of X1, X2. So as a result, if you change um, in the, the attribute of an independent alternative, let's say X5, the the probability ratio of P1 and P2 in first architecture will change, while it does not change in the ASU DNN architecture. So let's demonstrate some results from the ASU DNN um, experiments. The first is really some performance gain. So we really compare ASU DNN to fully connected DNN with um, a very high dimensional hyperparameter, and then we train a lot of models, and then the sort them uh, based on the performance. So, so here, basically, the green line represents the performance of ASU DNN, and red line represents performance of FDNN. We can see the better performance in the testing set. Um, actually, the result hold for both validation and testing set. We try two different data sets, we gain the same result. The second, more interesting, is about the substitution pattern we could get from ASU DNN. As I suggested before, the fully connected DNN tends to be too complex to reflect the reality, while a simple ML model tends to be too simple to reflect reality. And then if you look at the substitution pattern of ASU DNN, you could see a very interesting mixture here. Basically, if you look at the graph um, here, in fully connected DNN, I, as I argued, the market share of a bus tend to decrease when we increase the driving cost um, of driving, which is counterintuitive. Um, but if you look at ASU DNN, because we have the IA constraint, um, when we increase the driving cost, 
Now, in this scenario, then you could see that the market share of bus, the public transit, keep increasing without this decreasing trend. So overall, you can see ASUD and really combine some regularity, particularly the IIA constraint from the ML, but also get some richness from being um, its um, extraordinary approximation power. So that's the end of the second paper. But in the third paper, we really try to find a synergetic framework of discrete Charles model and DNM. Because the, in the previous paper, we kind of start with one piece of the behavior knowledge and then introduce that into deep neural network. But here we try to say, well, you have a two system of knowledge and how to combine them. So the main research question is how to synergize discrete Charles models and deep neural networks to analyze individual decision making. And the answer is relatively straightforward. We call it a zero-based residual neural network, TB ResNet. So the Vx here is kind of composite utility function. And then Vt here represents the utility function from the theory-based part. And Vdnm is the utility function from the DNN or the data-driven part. We basically combine the two parts by a convex uh, combination. It's a one minus delta and delta weighting. And then if you look at visualization, it will look like this on the right-hand side. So two quick remarks. The first is um, this architecture really demonstrates that DCM and DNN are complementary in model complexity. I suggest by static learning theory, DCM tends to be too simple, DNN tends to be too complex, and some middle ground between them should be optimal. And this is just a very straightforward approach to find the middle ground. And second is this very simple combination really marked the uniqueness of DNN among all the machine learning classifiers because DNN has an inherent, inherent utility interpretation. So you can combine through the utility function. Um, um, it kind of makes the, uh, this synergy very feasible, but if you think about other machine learning classifiers, um, you cannot find a very simple architecture as such. So this is a very simple combination, but you have very diverse perspectives to think about this, this, um, this model. The first is, is really just weighted model ensembles with this delta weighting. And then if your delta goes to zero, the system is dominated by discrete choice models. And then when delta goes to one, the system is dominated by this, uh, deep neural networks. And we name it as a zero-based ResNet because it is really an analogy to the standard ResNet because if you just replace one minus delta DCM by the identity, uh, identity uh, function, you will get the standard ResNet. And then another way to think about delta is delta is really a regularization term in the system because if delta take value between zero and one, you can see both one minus delta and delta shrink the magnitude of the zero bar base part and the data driven part. And we know that shrinkage effect is more or less similar to the L2 regularization. So it's kind of a um, regularization term. Here. And last one, more interesting is delta can be used for zero diagonal system. Remember it's here, delta is a hyperparameter. So we're going to train and learn it from the data. So in the end, if we find that the optimal delta is approaching one, then the system, meaning that the optimal system is dominated by the DNN part. And then it suggests that the DCM, the theory, is not very complete. While if the delta is opposite, it's very close to zero, and then the system will be, the optimal system is dominated by discrete choice model. It suggests that theory is relatively complete. Um, the framework is also very flexible because we could use any utility theory for the zero-based part and any DNN architecture for the DNN part. So we designed three scenarios, a uh, standard discrete Charles model scenario, basically people choose between K alternatives, and then the decision-making under uncertainty scenario, and then we use a prospect theory for the VT term, basically people choose between two risky payoffs, and then have the uh, temporary decision-making scenario, and we use the hyperpoly discounting. Um, it's an HD rest that uh, basically um, temporary decision-making is uh, choosing uh, some present value versus some future value. So again, very high level results. First is uh, some pattern in utility function. So here on the left-hand side is um, utility visualization for the uh, multi larger model. So it's basically uh, a 2D visualization about how utilities value vary with the um, uh, inputs. So here the utilities are the utility of using bus and the X and Y axis are the bus monetary cost in vehicle travel time cost. We're using bus. You can see when we increase this um, cost along the two dimensions and the utility decreases. And then with ML, you get about 50% prediction accuracy. With the DNN, can get a slightly higher prediction accuracy at 
percentage points. But if you look at the utility pattern on the right hand side, it's a quite irregular. So they kind of echo what I said before about stacker name theory. But when you start adjust the delta term to find the weighting between two sets, you can see at a certain point we get a, an optimal delta. And then the performance in the middle is a could outperform the both ends. And also, you look at the utility pattern, um, it inherits some regularity from the ML part, but also have some richness uh, from DNA part. So, high level observation is that a pure DNA tends to be overly irregular, while DCM tends to be overly regular in the utility patterns. And then this zero based resonance really strikes the balance between the two ends. The second is to focus on the predictive performance or um, model fitting in a classic terms. Um, look at the ML. Again, the x-axis is the delta value. When delta goes to zero, it's just a pure ML framework. Delta equal to one is a DNA. And then the origin line represents the prediction accuracy, and the brown line is a cross entropy loss. So prediction accuracy, the higher, the better. For uh, the cross entropy loss, the lower, the better. And you can observe the concavity in the accuracy, and then the a convexity in the cross entropy loss, which means that you could find some optimal delta in between to outperform the both ends. And it's very similar with um, in the two other scenarios for decision making on uncertainty and the temporal decision making. So a high level observation is that DNA tend to overfit the reality while DCM tends to underfit the reality, but zero base resonance really strike the balance and addressing the overfitting and underfitting from the both ends. Uh, we have more thorough uh, comparison in the paper. So basically, we compared the zero base resonator to the ML, PT, and um, hybrid discounting, and also compared to DNNs in terms of prediction accuracy, interoperability, and robustness. So we see the improvement on basically all the fronts. You know, when you start to explore the research direction, you sometimes cannot stop yourself from keep writing papers. Um, after we uh, finish the three papers, we basically continue to write some spin up papers. Uh, one is more on that theory side, another is um, more on the application side. Um, but today, I don't think I have time to go through the details. I would just use the one slide to introduce each one of the paper here. So the theory paper is about a static learning theory for deep neural network for choice analysis. So there are two main questions we try to address. The first is, uh, whenever you read a machine learning paper, you feel something awkward about that because people always tell you that they invent some new architecture um, and then you get a higher predictive performance. The performance is like 3% higher than the old ones, but they never tell you the confidence interval or this prediction, uh, pr prediction gain, whether that's statistically significant or not. So it looks like a DNA is a totally deterministic for framework without telling us anything about you know, the statistical modeling. So, um, but this paper really tried to introduce a static learning theory um, to the DNA for choice analysis. Um, the, 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 the truth is that DNA still has all the statistical foundation, but we'll need to use the modern non-asymptotic statistic as opposed to the kind of classical asymptotic statistic in, in central limit theory or law of large numbers. So it's different statistical foundation, um, but it still exists. A second question is really about uh, interpretability. So as you have heard, they, that I used uh, interpre interpretation or interpretability a few times in presentation, but I did not even try to define it. And it is such an ambiguous term. People always ask, what do I mean by this term? Um, so this paper will try to provide some uh, tentative definition um, for interpretability in this kind of DNA for choice analysis scenario. The applied paper really tried to address more um, kind of applied um, work, but it is not a pure application uh, like you know, using a DNN to, to understand the um, more choice with some prediction accuracy, but it's really a classical question. We name it as a T-shaped data for reviewing a state of preference. Especially these days, um, you know, we try to understand the like preference for emergent mobility. You often have the two types of data. On one side, you have all the kind of reviewer person data, we call it the wide, but the shallow data is kind of um, public uh, travel survey data or the average data at the city level. Um, but on the other side, you often have this kind of narrow but deep data. Like you conduct a small scale field experiment or conduct a survey uh, to understand, understand the specific phenomena you are interested in, like autonomous vehicles. Um, the classical way to combine them is really just use nested larger model. But in that paper, we try to um, design a multitask learning deep neural network to combine RP and SP. And it will also demonstrate some connection 
between this framework with a classical nested larger model. So here are the, uh, there are just uh, five papers. Um, so this slide, I just want to provide a very quick recap about a coherent storyline for DNA for choice analysis. So basically the first paper really started with the black box DNA challenge, but realize very quickly DNA is really not black box. It has a utility interpretation. Even if we start with a naive artificial neural network, we could gain complete economic information from the neural network. However, we also see that um, naive DNA has limitations in terms of the economic information they provide. And then we start to ask if we have some prior knowledge, can we use that to reduce the complexity, complexity of deep neural network? Can we impose some constraints, this IA constraint into the model? And uh, it's a regularization perspective, it's architecture design perspective. In the end, the ASU DNA really provide a higher performance and interpretation. And then we say, if we go beyond just one piece of a behavior knowledge, but we have the two systems of knowledge, can we have a synergetic and a simple framework to combine them? And then we come to the theory-based ResNet, um, realize this, that's, uh, this framework is very flexible. We could um, design any, uh, use any utility theory for the theory part, and the DNA architecture for the DNA part. And then we demonstrate the gain in prediction and patient robustness. Then we also introduce the new theoretical -like foundation for DNA of choice analysis. It's a static learning theory. In the end, say, well, um, this uh, framework can, can be used not only for the kind of standard um, uh, choice analysis, but it can, like, if you have a review and state preference data, you can change architecture a little bit to combine them and to gain the, um, some uh, static efficiency and address the bias from different data sources. So I want to spend a little bit of time to talk about implications, um, mainly from three different perspectives, demand modeling perspective, computer science perspective, and uh, all the other applications you could think about from this, um, this new foundation. So first, uh, from the travel demand modeling perspective, we think it really lay out the new foundation of using DNA for choice analysis, because we really tackle a lot of important topics. For example, we introduce a difference between non-asymptotic versus asymptotic statistic. We provide the learning theory as a new foundation for the research. And we talk about the random utility mechanization framework for DNA, introduce how to design new models um, through regularization, how to specify utilities through the network design, and also tack, um, tackle other important topics like generalization and robustness. But on the other side, through my presentation today, I really want to correct some misconceptions in our research community. So if today, before you hear my presentation, you still hold the the view that maybe DNA is just a black box model, maybe DNA is just for uh, prediction only, and it's a pure computer science modeling paradigm. But I hope after my presentation today, you can gain a very different perspective. First, I would not say DNA is a pure black box, but I would say DNA could provide a lot of useful information we want. And uh, if you just use classical DCM as a benchmark, you could get all the kind of information. And it's not just for prediction only because it has a um, underlying utility theory has a behavior content, it can be used for policy analysis. And also not just a pure computer science tool, but has very close connection to economics and the transportation, the classical research. And second is, I really want to emphasize the synergetic perspective here, because if you really adopt a computer science perspective, you will realize this, um, uh, uh, the five papers that I present today is a little bit awkward, because whenever um, you think about architecture, the pure computer science would say, well, this is just a very naive artificial neural network. What about those um, ResNet, VGG transformers? Those are fancy architectures. If you think about interpretation, then people are looking for those, you know, those keywords like line and sharp, and none of them really exist in my papers. And then you talk about regularization, you have all the LP, um, L0, L1, L2 regularization, SGD, and other computational tools. I didn't mention any of them. So I want to give you some quick responses to these questions. So first is it's really missed the point because the whole the, the whole motivation is based on reconciling rather than exacerbation this um, this tension between the two modeling paradigms. And second, very concretely, this synergetic perspective really introduced a lot of benefits. For example, um, we could get a uh, valuable results uh, in terms of like architecture. Previously, you only think about architecture as some mechanical tool from the computer science. Field, but now you realize architecture has a utility theory meaning, and then we can even get social welfare from the DNA architecture. And lastly, uh, what I say today is really very compatible 
uh, with all the computer science uh, frameworks, you could think about using other architectures, but you could still get all the economic information from the DNS. A third point is about applications. So I want to just confess from that in all the papers I present today, I use a very naive applications. Um, they're all about travel mode choice. This kind of classical example, I use the travel survey. And then the data points, well, pretty small, it's 10,000. But there are benefits of being naive because it's easy to expand them to the other application, like choice of other trial modes, um, choice of between all the emerging mobilities, um, choice for urban activities, locations, or other, even choices beyond the mobility fields. Um, also, to facilitate the um, uh, as a researcher to replicate our work, we kind of follow the open science practice. Um, for five pairs present today, I think four of them, I, we put the open repositories um, on GitHub, and you could find the links in these papers. And uh, it's not just uh, we could simply apply this work to get a better like, performance, a predictable performance based on this new theoretic foundation. We really could ask uh, deeper questions in our applications. Um, through the DNM, for example, um, we think about electric vehicles, you could ask, of course, EV choice question, who will first adopt EV, and you could use DNM to analyze that. We could also ask questions about elasticity, um, how the EV charging price influence EV adoption, marginal rate style, uh, marginal rate of substitution question, uh, how the cost of EV trade off with the accessibility of EV charging stations, market share question, social welfare question. So through our work, we try to say that you know, all those classical microeconomics or DCM questions, you could address them at least partially through this DNA framework. So uh, people often ask me what we are doing now. So what I presented today, uh, something uh, work we started in 2018, so we try to combine the DCM and DNA, um, but we stick with kind of classical um, cross-section data structure. Um, these days, uh, we try to develop uh, continue this line of work, but a two slightly different directions. So because we know DNA as a power is to address the unstructured data. So we try to incorporate urban imagery into the demand analysis. And uh, also DNA looks like a determinist, deterministic system, but actually there is some static learning theory underlying that. So try to understand uncertainty um, of this choice model of the DNM for choice analysis. And lastly, uh, when I talk about the human decision making, there are some novel aspects. We try to understand computational justice for the urban environment. So this is the last slide. I want to give you some, I, I, I call it a proof by history to talk about the development of discrete choice models and, um, and deep neural networks. Um, so I believe the audience today are very familiar with discrete choice models, but I particularly like the summary from Daniel McFadden in 2001. I think that's the time he got a Nobel Prize and he provided a a very nice summary about the history of this way choice model. I believe the title is Economic Choice. And this is the opening sentence from the paper. He said that in 1960s, rapidly increasing availability of survey data on individual behavior and the advent of a digital computer that could analyze data focus attention on the variation in demand across individuals. It become in important to explain and model these variations as part of consumer theory rather than ad hoc dis um, dis disturbances. I really like this statement because it really summarizes those key components about the history in, the, in developing discrete choice models. You mentioned the survey data. It basically you could treat it as a data revolution in the 1960s and the 1970s. Talk about digital computers. That's a time people really start to get access to digital computers. You have the, you know, that's a kind of hardware revolution at the time. And then you think about the, we had this individual demand in trial because in the 1960s and 70s, you start to buy automobiles. And then that's really a new phenomenon. At the moment, and then as a result, the scholars develop new models. The discrete choice model framework really address this kind of uh, challenges or take advantage of this data and hardware re revolution very well. And this modeling paradigm really continue until today. And you could draw a parallel, uh, find some uh, interesting analogy about what happened in the past about five years, because we have very similar data revolution of the big and unstructured data. We have the hardware revolution, the cloud and GPU computing. And then we have the new phenomena, those emerging mobilities, connecting and alternative vehicles. And then we also have the DNM as a new modeling paradigm. So I really think like this era will become an um, interesting challenge of our generation. It's our, really our responsibility to develop a nice, um, and the new modeling paradigm to take advantage of the data and hardware revolution to address this new mobile phenomena. So 
this end of my uh, presentation today. I really want to thank uh, all my PhD committee members. You can see um, uh, they are Jinghua, Stephanie, and Dryson. They are very interdisciplinary uh, community uh, because the Jinghua from the um, computation field, and Stephanie from the computer science field, and Dryson from economics field. They really helped me a lot in developing those papers. And also, I have a very amazing um, RAs and friends help me to deliver this work. Um, they would they need to take a lot of credits for um, all my work um, today. So. That's all I want to present today, and uh, I'm happy to answer questions. Thanks a lot, Chen Hao. So we already have got uh, some questions, but um, before moving to questions, let's hear from uh, Professor Juan de Dios about his reflections about the work, and also like uh, his thoughts about the uh, future directions in this area. <clears throat> Thank you, Charisma. Can I can I uh, share a screen as well? Mm -hmm. Okay, let's see if I can do that. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure whether you're seeing that. Yes, working fine. Okay, okay, excellent. Um, thank you very much. And I had prepared this little uh, set of transparencies for in, in advance of this uh, talk. Um, oh, it's not working. <laughs> right there. Uh, first of all, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Wang. Uh, just to interrupt a bit, um, in my screen, I can see part of your slide. Like, is it the same for others, Shinhao? Can you see the full slide on your end? Um, Chris, well, yeah, I can see the, the full slide. Okay, that's fine. Oh, yeah, because I can see my own screen, but with something in the middle. Well, okay, I hope it's, it's okay. So, Anyway, I was saying that I want to congratulate Dr. Wang. It's a very highly interesting thesis, and I'm certain that it will start the trend of a work in many areas. Um, I must tell you that, unfortunately, uh, there were a lot of uh, little things that I didn't understand beyond my ability really to understand them quickly enough, but I still enjoy very much the contents. Um, I want to make some small criticisms that can surely be considered in future work. In particular, and with reference to paper one, um, I want to tell you, uh, in my opinion, uh, MNL is not appropriate for analyzing SP data. Uh, in your data set from Singapore, you have seven choices per individual. So you have what we call a pseudo panel, and this calls for a mixed logic model with an error component to tackle the panel effect and the results can change quite dramatically in some cases. In some cases, they don't change much, but in some cases they do. Um, second little criticism, you have several alternatives, and I'm not sure if all those alternatives could be really considered independent as required by the MNL. So maybe you should uh, test later uh, some more flexible models. And uh, one, when one gets older, one gets a little bit more fastidious about history. And uh, the NL, NL uh, nested logic and mixed logic were not created in the dates that you mentioned. It's 1973 for the NL, no, certainly not. Um, it was created in 76, jointly by Hugh Williams and Daly and Thackeray, not by Moshe or, or not even Mannheim and Alan Wilson, who were also close before that, but they didn't. Um, so that's, that's some stuff. Uh, there is a very nice book by uh, Boyce and Williams about the history of uh, travel demand forecasting. So maybe you can have a look at it. Um, finally, and this is more a doubt than a, a criticism. Uh, I, I'm not sure whether your MNL was specified with alternative specific constant. If they were, then the market share prediction should be exact. But I saw huge discrepancies in market share predictions in table 2.2. Of your paper one, um, but maybe you didn't specify it with a, with an alternative specific constant. Um, a, I um, there was something else I I, I miss here, but, um, which I want to tell. Uh, let me see if I can go back. Which didn't appear. Oh, this is not working. All right. Yes. And this is a very important question for me. Uh, can your DNN incorporate, for example, latent variables constructs as we are now using in what we call the state of practice in discrete choice models, which are, which are the hybrid choice models? Because that's something that would be really interesting 
if it was possible in your synergy about the two, the two ways. Uh, okay, now after reading the thesis and thinking about it, uh, I got a lot of modeling issues that came to my mind and I wish to mention them here. Um, uh, it, it's not that I'm um, considering them the, the, the same thing or anything like that, but they, sprang, they, they, they came to my mind very, very quickly when I thought about it. And the first one was, for example, when I think about uh, OD matrix estimation, and you, you can have uh, these kind of things by using a structure or an unstructured approach. And there seems to be a tension there also. In the first case, you would impose, for example, a, a gravity model form that constrains the result. In the latter, you just resort to say entropy maximizing without the modeling constraint, and you let, in a sense, um, the, the thing to be more free, but it can have certain problems. And these problems are related to the second thing I mentioned there. There is a long controversy in our field between people that advocate uh, that you should let the data decide versus those people that believe that the role of theory is inescapable. I have had a, a very, very recent discussion with a good friend of mine, Mark Godry, a very famous professor from the University of Montreal originally. Um, he is in the first camp. He believes that uh, data should be left to, to tell what is the form of the model. And for example, he's a very uh, strong uh, inspirator of the box Cox logic modeling. Uh, transformations of your your um, uh, level of service uh, parameters uh, using uh, box cox uh, transformations and they he argues that the box cox parameter can have any value however my good friend sergio jara diaz who is a theoretician believes that if the values of lambda in the box cox function are over one then the the model becomes uh, not consistent with utility uh, with um, microeconomic theory in the case of particularly variables that imply a consumption, for example, car ownership, or variables that, or, or, or the variable cost, for example, which is related to income inversely. Therefore, uh, in those cases, values of lambda over one are wrong, and, and the model should be disregarded, but Mark doesn't think so. However, this is not the case for time. Time could have really any value, and that would be okay. Now, there is a very famous example uh, I was, I was, um, this is kind of an, an anecdote in the middle of this uh, presentation. I was a young student in, in, in Leeds when um, there was this very famous study, the Wit Consult study being carried on, and they spent something like five million pounds on uh, developing this huge model. A uh, million pounds was at the time four million dollars, and the dollar was at the time a lot more than a dollar of today. So that was a really huge amount of money. And we had this, uh, this presentation by the leader of this uh, study that came to our seminar and said, uh, look, I have these five books and he brought these huge books to the table and I'm going to use these books um, to go to London and get money for building a lot of things that we are planning here for this uh, uh, county council. And, um, and, 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 and he said, the best thing about this model is that they, said it would cost five million pounds it cost five million pounds not a penny more and it would last for five years and it lasted five years not a not a month more okay great and then the next week we had the presentation by hugh williams my, that, that was my supervisor at the time and he came and told us that the with consult model was wrong because they had a nested logic model and the parameter beta was greater than lambda rather than the other way around and uh, therefore it was predicting wrong shares because it was a, a, a wrong model. So, and he coined a phrase that was <laughs> for me very nice. He said, beware of the theoretician, beware of the theoretician because theory really can help you a lot. And I think you are using that in your own presentation. Uh, another thought that came to my mind was the equifinality issue where you can obtain the same model form. For example, think about an aggregate multinomial logic model. And that may, may be obtained by completely different uh, approaches, entropy maximizing and random utility maximization. But the, the interpretation, and you talk about interpretation, the interpretation of the scale parameter mu in your, in your notation is vastly different. In, in one case, it's a Lagrange multiplier. In the second case, it's pi over square root of sigma, where sigma is the Gamble's error standard deviation. And that provides this interpretation with the derivation of microeconomic formula you use to evaluate projects. In the, in the first case, you cannot. So that is an, an interesting thought 
that came to my mind also when reading your thesis. <clears throat> Finally, and if I can carry on, uh, yes, uh, I want to mention something that the thesis touches on, although marginally, which is the possibility that different choice mechanisms or choice heuristics may be present or at work in a given data set. Um, I have studied this possibility with, with some students using latent class models for the case where we have several heuristics. For example, you can have people uh, choosing by random utility maximization, elimination by aspects, or satisfying, and you can estimate a model, which is a, an interesting model, which features the possibility of alternative decision rules at the interpersonal level. Currently, we are working on the same idea, but at the intrapersonal level. That is the possibility that a particular individual may change the way that she or he decides depending on the context. For example, the product of interest, the choice complexity, the individual engagement with the product, and the processing abilities of the individual, et cetera. Okay, those things think to me, seem to me uh, to be uh, kind of related with your work. And I wonder whether you see any possibility of carrying on and extending your work in these kind of um, thoughts. That would be for my part. And I left for, 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 for people uh, some, some, uh, some of my papers before that refer to the things I was talking here so that you can make have a look if you want to have more details. Thank you very much, Carisma. Thanks a lot. Uh, so uh, there are a couple of questions uh, in the Q&A. So Shenhao, maybe you can uh, select uh, the order you want to answer them and answer them live. Uh, thanks, Chrisma and uh, Professor Juan de Dios. So maybe I could give them some quick responses about uh, um, Professor Juan de Dios's comments. I think they are all very interesting. And actually, I put a lot of thoughts uh, on uh, many of them. So, but first of all, I want to really acknowledge that the papers I present today are uh, kind of a starting point. Um, it just really cannot like comparable to, you know, all the rich and very established discrete choice model framework we established for five decades. So we ask all kinds of questions in the past. So there are a lot of things we did not address and it is kind of impossible for me to address in two or three you know, years. Um, but a lot of things I, I just uh, think about, I thought about and how to address, for example, who mentioned the relation between ML and NL and mixed larger model. Like uh, we were very aware that the data that we got like state preference data is ML is not a best way to model it because of the kind of random error structure uh, in the data set. So in this which model model is mixed larger, but then we should think about some extension of deep neural networks to, to incorporate this kind of error structure. Um, so I think it will be related to something like a Bayesian approach, uh, like Bayesian deep neural network to introduce some randomness in the deep neural network to, to incorporate this, uh, this, this kind of um, error structure in state preference data. And also uh, about the relationship with the latent, latent class or latent uh, variable models. So DNA is like inherently a latent class or latent variable models, because if you think about the difference between DNA and the discrete choice model, is really the deep structure that matters. And we could really just name all the neurons, like deep neurons, as some latent variables or latent classes. Now, of course, it's not like a simple, like single latent variable or single latent class. Um, it has a very complicated layer by layer structure. It is a really, um, you know, the latent variables that DNA uh, introduce a new thing. And we could think about the connection. For example, I talked about the combined RP and SP in that framework. So the kind of, you could treat the um, multi-task learning DNA as a, some way to like construct the latent space to combine the two data sets. Data sets. Um, I think you also talked about um, several as other aspects about OD matrix and the, the different decision rules. Um, I think usually you consider introducing them as some constraint as a DNA or like in OD matrix, um, uh, how to estimate OD matrix, I think they will be related to the graph neural networks. Uh, try to think about the OD matrix as some graph structure and introduce the graph computation in that. For decision rules, I think um, for those satisfying 
or other rules. Maybe you could use some behavior constraint, as I discussed in the second paper, or could just use the DNA as a, like to approximate the design rules. Um, last one is a very broad question you mentioned about the theory-driven versus the data-driven approach. I think the, my position is really just summarized in that kind of synergetic approach. I do not believe um, you know, it will a pure data-driven approach or a pure zero-driven approach could solve the problem, it will be something in the middle. And if you look at the kind of the short history of the um, deep learning field, I think about 2015, people were arguing that we should adopt a pure data-driven approach, but about like in three or five years, people started to believe we still need a lot of like theory, some constraint and some prior notion about the context. And we try to combine the theory-based uh, and the database approach together. So. Um, in the machine learning terms, they call it automatic learning versus handcrafted learning. And then um, I think it's this ongoing trying to merge the two lines of thoughts. Um, yeah, so this is my uh, hello uh, like responses uh, to Professor Huang um, comments. comment. Um, Christmas, so I should start to respond to other comments. Okay, um, yeah, let me see. So I think the first question is about how to get a utility function from DNA. So, um, so I think the first paper argues that the utility, utility function exists in DNA. So basically, um, if you could, you, because it exists, you, you use a TensorFlow or PyTorch, they could give you that numeric information from a deep neural network. Basically, you remove the last stop the max layer, so all the layer before softmax layer give you the utility function. So computationally, you could get the economic information. Um, yeah, and then when you do some simulation, like uh, changing some input variables, you could observe the uh, uh, attributes, the, the, the characteristics of the utility function in DNNs. So the second question from Joe Fung is, can DNN perfectly reproduce a result from DCM? Um, uh, I don't think so. Um, the, the answer is, the, the answer really lies in the, the standard learning theory that slides. So if you do a simulation through a discrete choice model, it will give you a super regular um, data set. And then, but if you start with a DNA model family, the model family tends to be very complex. So it will give you some irregular patterns even you fit that with a data set generated from DCM. But um, if you impose some constraint, you will kind of fit the DCM result better. And if you adopt uh, the uh, zero-based ResNet approach, because DCM has, is a um, kind of specific case in TB ResNet. So I think in that case, you could perfectly reproduce the result from discrete choice models. I think probably we have time for one more question uh, because we are just, we have two minutes left. Okay, so let me and answer. And the rest, you. maybe you can uh, reply to the uh, people later. Okay, so the, the third question is about whether I thought about other supervised learning classifier for choice analysis, um, or I see DNA as a dominant classifier. I think that's a very good question about the relation between deep neural network and all the mach other machine learning classifiers. Um, in my view, um, I, I didn't thought about using other supervised learning classifier for choice analysis, but I think that DNA and DCM just have this kind of inherent uh, similarity through the utility interpretation. So you really facilitate a lot of like, like model design perspective or regularization perspectives um, in generating you know, innovative models. I thought about other machine learning classifiers, but for the decision tree or run forest, those type of classifiers, they're more like deterministic classifiers. And it's kind of hard even to get as a probably random decision rule uh, from those models. So I would say DNN really provide a lot of convenience for us to analyze um, individual choices. Um, uh, I, I would argue, Oh, machine learning classifier, each one of them have their strength. But for choice analysis, uh, I think the, I wouldn't say DNA is a dominating classifier, but it's provided like future potentials, like introducing the uh, graph structure and through a DNA framework or uh, incorporate the unconventional data into DNA. So I think DNA is very powerful. Uh, it's not necessarily dominating all the other classifier in all the aspects. Um, Christmas, I think we have one minute or we should stop here. Yes, yes. Okay. So uh, thanks a lot, Chen Hao, and thanks a lot, Juan de Dios. Uh, so uh, it was a very lively discussion and a lot of food for thought for the young researchers. 
And uh, so I, I uh, shared some upcoming events uh, in the chat box. So keep an eye on them. And also the ITBR 2012 uh, conference is going to be in December 12th to 16th, I believe, in Chile. So stay tuned for that about the deadlines. And uh, I would also like to use this uh, opportunity to again thank uh, Christina and the rest of the team at UC Davis and uh, Giovanni uh, Chichela, who couldn't join today, but uh, they provide a lot of support in the uh, in arranging the Zoom seminar. So thanks to them. And so we will see you uh, in Chile, and uh, we will be in touch over email. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Bye. Thank you. <clears throat>